Good morning. I have one analysis this morning. I just was going to let everybody know that uh, Sunday is, uh, today is also Flag Day. It's uh, the day that we uh, uh, have the same flag. We have one flag now, and that happened in 1777. Before that, there were several different flags, but we adopted the flag we have now back in 1777. So uh, take time to uh, celebrate Flag Day. Uh, let us open in our opening prayer. Lord, open our hearts this day to receive your word for us. Give us the courage and the hope that we need in our lives. Amen. Would you please join me in our call to worship? Raise your voices in response to God's goodness. We praise you, O Lord, for all the blessings you have given us. Lift your hearts in sweet, sweet, sweet surrender to God's mercy. We thank you, O Lord, for hearing the prayers of our hearts. God is good. Praise be to God. The love and mercy of God never fails. Amen. Amen. And now God will lead us in our children's story. Good morning, everyone. Today's story is one that we have all heard probably many times, um, but while it's primarily for children, I'm hoping that the grown-ups will listen too, because I think there's a good message in here for all of us in this story. So today we're going to be talking about Jesus. Uh, if you remember the last few weeks, our stories have been way before Jesus was born. Today's story is about Jesus, and we all know that Jesus liked to travel around, and he would go from town to town, and when he would get to a town, he would usually go someplace like into a big field or an open space, because lots of people like to come and hear what Jesus had to say, and usually the people who came were grown-ups. So on this particular day, Jesus was probably sitting in a field, and he was talking about God, and the grown-ups were gathering. Well, of course, some of those grown-ups had children with them, and some of the children, as children like to do, wanted to run up and see this guy. Well, Jesus' friends stopped them, and they said, no, no, go away, go away. And sometimes we grown-ups do that to kids. But Jesus did not do that. Jesus saw what was going on, and Jesus said, wait a minute, bring those children to me. And the grown-ups were pretty surprised that Jesus would want to see kids, but he did. Now the Bible doesn't tell us what those kids and Jesus did, but I think we can kind of imagine that maybe some of the kids sat on his lap, and some of the kids maybe sat around him. And I can picture giggling and laughing, and maybe Jesus was telling stories. And it's kind of fun to remember that Jesus loved the children. And children were so special to Jesus. And they were so special that Jesus turned around to the grown-ups, and he said, you need to act more like children. Now, we like to tell children that they need to act like grown-ups, right? But Jesus said the grown-ups needed to act like the children. And why in the world would Jesus say that? Well, if you think about how children act, you kids are really good at making friends. When you meet somebody, you don't ask them first, where they live, or where their grandparents came from, or what kind of a house they have. You just ask them, do you like to play baseball? Me too. Or do you like to draw? Come on, let's go do that. And we grown-ups can learn from you kids some things. Do you ever hear kids when they giggle and laugh? They don't make it up. They're just happy inside. And I think Jesus was telling us that we need to let go of some of those things that we used to have when, when we were kids 
We need to let go of the things that stop us from acting like a child or thinking or loving like children do. So I think it's important for all of us, for you kids, remember that you are very special to Jesus. You are so special that he stopped the grown-ups from keeping kids away from him and he had them come and sit right with him. And for the grown-ups, try to remember sometimes to what it was like when you were a kid and remember that Jesus would like you to have that feeling more often. Okay? Amen. Our first hymn this morning is Shall We Gather at the River?
Our gospel reading this morning is from Matthew chapter 9, uh, verse 35 through 10, 8. Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and curing every disease and every sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them, because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Then Jesus summoned his twelve disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits, to cast them out and to cure every disease and every sickness. These are the names of the twelve apostles. First, Simon, also known as Peter, his brother Andrew, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, Simon the Canaan, and Judas Iscariot, the one who portrayed him. These twelve Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Go nowhere among the Gentiles, and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. As you go proclaim the good news, the kingdom of heaven has come near. Cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. You receive without payment, give without payment. And this ends our scripture readings for this morning. As I was preparing my message for this Sunday uh, from the gospel that I read to you from Matthew, it reminded me a long time ago of a time where I lived in Great Falls, Montana, back in the early 1970s as a 19-year-old kid. Yes, I know some of you still think I am a kid, uh, but uh, I was a young man back then. At that time in Montana, harvesting wheat was quite an operation. I can remember traveling throughout the state of Montana, watching the combines harvesting fields that seemed to go on forever. The wheat belt, if you don't know, it runs from mid-Texas all the way up to Alberta, Canada. You know, one day uh, I met a man and I really do not remember his name, but I remember having the conversation about harvesting with combines because that's what he did uh, as part of his work uh, from uh, early spring until they made their way up to late fall at the Canadian border. And he told me that they would travel to different families uh, that got together and started out in Texas they would start out in caravans, and what I mean by a caravan is that they had their combines on uh, big trucks, uh, they had campers that they lived in, uh, and of course they had the trucks to, to, uh, to, get, uh, to harvest the uh, wheat from the combines. And he told me about how each member of a family worked uh, in the fields or uh, worked on equipment. And he would keep telling me that each family member had an assigned task. You know, some would drive the combines and some would drive the trucks. And even children, as young as maybe 12 or 13, if they were uh, big enough uh, to get in a truck and drive it in the fields, uh, that's what they did. And the women, they had a job to do too, and it was more than just preparing meals. Uh, if a part, uh, on a, on a, a rig broke down, it was their responsibility uh, to make sure they had a part or they had to go get a part. A lot of time they staged the parts ahead of time on stuff that broke down on a regular basis. They kept extra parts in the campers and the trucks. But the women sometimes had to travel a distance to get parts to keep the operation going. And he told me because everybody knew their task ahead of time, 
pretty much it was a smooth operation all the way from Texas up to the Canadian border. You know, these folks that combined for their livelihood, they were not special people. But you know something? If, as I'm doing this serving this morning, if you're out putting a piece of bread in your toaster, you might think they are special people. But they were actually just down-to-earth people, hard-working folks that loved their way of life. You know, and once their season of combining was over, they went back to their homes. They sent their kids off to school like we do. They sent their older kids off when they graduated from high school to college. And they loved that way of life. And they loved living in rural America. Lucky for you and me this morning, Jesus is now looking for professional harvesters. He is looking for those who will make themselves available to go out and help with the harvest. You know, Jesus started out with just 12 ordinary workers who were just ordinary people too. They were fishermen. We had a tax collector. We had, some would say, a loudmouth, being Peter. And we even had a betrayer. Jesus gathered these 12 and over three years, he tried to give them and teach them a little on-the-job training about what he was preparing them for. And I'm not sure over the three years if they really ever truly knew where they were headed. What's interesting is in this gospel this morning is that Jesus gives them first what I would call a short-term mission to go out in the course harvest people before sending them on a permanent lifelong mission. He doesn't send them right away to the Gentiles in the Samaritans, but he says he's going to send them to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. I think he, what he is saying to these twelve is he wants them to stay local and he wants them to get their feet a little wet before they go out and try to take on the world. By, their, by the way, their mission, that harvesting that Jesus asked them to do, did eventually take them out into the world. Now I think we can learn a lot about harvesting from Jesus this morning, but I also believe those families of the 1970s who harvest those fields can also help us out some too. The first thing you notice is whether you're talking about the 12 disciples or the families who worked the fields from Texas to the Canadian border, they did not do it by themselves. In both cases, they worked together to take in the harvest. And in both cases, they were willing to make themselves available to do the work. You know, that Jesus gave the disciples a specific target to hit in this gospel this morning. He says he wants them to go to the lost sheep of Israel. In the case of the harvesting families, they had also had a specific target they had to hit. They had to hit all the fields in all those different states up to the Canadian border, and they did it month after month after month. And most of the time they did it from daylight to dark working in those fields. Jesus also gave the disciples a goal to hit. The primary focus was, of course, to proclaim the good news, not merely with words. Jesus expected more than just words. It was also to be done by action. And I think our families who worked those fields and harvested that wheat would tell you that you cannot harvest sweet with just words. There's got to be some action involved. Jesus gave his disciples a plan to sustain themselves so they could live while they were doing their harvesting, just like he gave the families who combined. 
In case of his disciples, he tells them right up front, they will be living off of whatever their host provides. They will be completely dependent on strangers. Think about that. Completely dependent on the hospitality of the strangers. What this really means, I think, to me, is that they need to put their trust in God. These disciples will be entering both welcome and hostile environments, and they will need to be prepared to act accordingly. And of course, when you're all working the fields of the Midwest in the open rangelands, you need to have your supplies staged, and you need to be prepared for whatever Mother Nature throws your way. Strong and severe weather can pop up any time on the, on the plains. Jesus was always, I think, giving, trying at least, to give his disciple, disciples a realistic view of what the future might lay ahead for them. This opening mission work of going out and harvesting to the lost sheep of Israel will give them just a taste of the dangers that would come when they started harvesting in Gentile in some Marian regions. Families that combine for a living understand the dangers that lie ahead. Not only the dangers of being around all that heavy equipment, the trucks and the combines and the danger that poses to you, but also the danger that happens to you when fatigue comes on when you're working from daylight to dark. You know, this same harvest is offered to us, the Church of Jesus Christ. The problem is that it's easy for us to see the Church as a safe place, and secure place from which to see the world in its darkness from a distance. We sometimes forget we sometimes forget that Jesus gave us the church as a training ground to go out into our community and into, world, into the world to do some harvesting for him. We need to be asking ourselves questions, probably the same questions the disciples themselves ask themselves as Jesus sent them out into the world. Who is our target? Who are the specific people in our community to whom Jesus is sending us? What are we willing to risk in order to reach them? What is our goal? Are we proclaiming the good news of God's kingdom, both present and future, through both words and yes, actions, how are we participating in the healing of the bodies and souls of our neighbors? What is our plan to sustain ourselves? Are we hoarding resources as a means of sustaining the church as an institution? Or are we depending on God for our daily bread while sharing our resources with others in need? Are we offering peace to our neighbors and to the strangers we encounter in our lives. What are we willing to risk? Are we willing to be at odds with the culture around us because of our faith in Christ? Are we willing to risk ridicule and persecution because we proclaim Christ and minister in ways that reflect His kingdom? Are we willing to stand for what is right, what is just, and what is true when the world seeks to conform us to its evil ways? Harvesting for Jesus takes hard, hard work, and people who actually want to make themselves available to do that work. I think we are finding that out during this pandemic. We've had to find new ways to harvest in this virtual service 
is one of the ways that we do that. I guess we're finding out that we can actually change as a church. We can find new ways to harvest. When it comes to the harvest, I think Jesus would say there is nothing more important to advancing the kingdom of God than we make when we make ourselves available, not only by using our words, but to put those words actually into action. Amen. Uh, if you want, you can, before I start the communion service, you can pause me and you can get your bread and juice and then you could start playing again. So let us be in prayer. We are one bread, one body, one cup of blessing. Though we are many throughout the earth and this church community is scattered, in your many kitchens, in living rooms, rest your hands lightly upon these elements, which we set aside today to be a sacrament. Let us ask God's blessing upon them. Gentle, Gentle Redeemer, Redeemer there, there is, is no, no lockdown, lockdown on your blessing, blessing and, and no quarantine, quarantine on grace. grace. Send your spirit of life and love, power and, and blessing, blessing upon every table where your child shelters in place. place that this bread may be broken and gathered in love, and this cup poured out to give hope to all. Risen Christ, live in us, that we may live in you. Breathe in us, that we may breathe in you. We remember that Paul the Apostle wrote the letters to congregations through all places we now call Greece, Turkey, and Macedonia. And they were the first remote worship resources. Our online service has a long heritage. The communion words sent to the church at Corinth were these. For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way he took the cup also after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let us in our many, many places receive, receive the, gift the gift of God, God the bread of heaven. heaven. We, we are, are one in Christ in the bread, bread we, we share. Take and eat. The body of Christ broken for you. The cup, the blood of Christ. Let us in, in our many, many places receive, receive the gift of God, God the cup, cup of blessing. blessing. We, we are, are one in Christ in the, in the cup, cup we, we share. Take and drink. Let us be in prayer. Let us pray in thanksgiving for this meal of grace, rejoicing by the very method of our worship. We embody the truth that Christ's love is not limited by buildings made with human hands, nor contained in human ceremonies, but blows us free as the Spirit in all places. Spirit, Spirit of Christ, Christ you have blessed our, our tables and our lives. lives. May the eating of this bread give us courage to speak faith and act love, not only in church sanctuaries, but in your precious world. And may the drinking of this cup renew our hope, even in the midst of pandemic. Wrap your hopeful presence around all whose bodies, spirits, and hearts need healing, and let us become your compassion and safe refuge. Amen. We do have some uh, joys and concerns uh, this morning. Uh, I did get an email from uh, Norma uh, asking for our prayers for her daughter-in-law, Sheila, uh, Jeff's uh, wife. Uh, she
she's having a biopsy procedure done this week. Uh, I would like to have you uh, uh, have prayers for uh, Gail and her son and uh, Patricia. And also, uh, Gail um, has a big family, and there's you know different members in the family that are experiencing uh, issues. So we really need to keep Gail and her family in our prayers this week and the weeks to come. Uh, they are experiencing a lot and going through a lot. I would like to also keep uh, our prayers in the, for the family of Jim Graves. Uh, keep Doris and uh, Matthew in your prayers. Um, would also like to uh, thank Larry uh, for all the hard work that he's uh, put into the flower garden out front of the church here. If you haven't had a chance to drive by, by and see it, it's pretty amazing. Uh, flowers look beautiful. He's put in a lot of mulch. Uh, and it really looks really nice. I uh, would like to wish uh, Gideon a happy birthday, uh, which he's celebrating on the 15th. Um, would also like to congratulate uh, Lucas and Tristan on uh, graduating this year. I uh, would also like to pass that uh, congratulation on to the entire class of 2020. Uh, uh, the kids, they experienced some, experiencing something different uh, this year with the pandemic. Uh, it's probably something they're not going to forget about uh, as they grow up. Uh, but we pray that they can have a great experience with their graduation and get to celebrate it in special ways with their families and friends. And I would just like to uh, thank the uh, youth group kids who got together uh, for a small gathering. Uh, this past uh, Sunday uh, at my house, uh, we had a few and we kind of social distanced and uh, had a few hot dogs and some marshmallows and uh, shared with each other and it was just a great time uh, to see the kids again. And so, uh, let us be in prayer. We would sing glad songs to you, Commission God as we enter your heart with thanksgiving on our lips, for you are the love which never ends, that joy which overflows, that faith which is always full. We proclaim our praise to you, voice of compassion, as you would send us into the world in which we live, for you are the word which can truly speak to power. The healing we can offer to the broken, the justice, which can replace oppression. We would offer our hands and hearts to you, imaginative spirit, as you teach us new steps in this dance that we call life. For you are the cleanser of our messy hearts, the breath of hope for shallow lungs, and the password for access to grace. We have lifted up to you many joys and concerns, Father. We ask you to hear our prayers, to touch Sheila and Gail and her son and family and Patricia. We ask you to be with Doris and Matthew and let them feel your warmth. We give you thanks for Larry, who spends many hours in working at our church to make it look beautiful. We give you thanks for Gideon's birthday. We give you thanks for Lucas and Tristan and the class of 2020 graduating in this time of pandemic. Let them have a happy graduation. Let their hearts be joyful and let them celebrate with their families. And I give you thanks for having the ability to see my youth group that I haven't seen for two and a half months, just to share a little bit with them it was a joy to see them and visit with them. And now we take a moment and bring our silent prayers to you this morning. God in community, holy and one, 
even as we pray, as you taught us. Our, Our Father, Father, who art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our closing hymn this morning is, I Need Thee Every Hour. I need thee every hour, most gracious Lord. No tender voice like thine can peace afford. I need thee, oh I need thee, every hour I need thee.